How you doing? Man, the mic is on. We're coming in loud tonight. Are you ready? Don't get loud. You should get loud, shouldn't we? You guys excited? Hey, welcome to Encounter. I want to welcome everyone out to the greatest place to be on a Friday night. My name is Bill Reeser. I'm the pastor of Encounter. I want to welcome everyone here at Church of the Savior. I want to welcome our family from Revive back in the house. I want to welcome all of our friends around the country that tune in from California, Illinois, New York, Texas. People tune in from all over the country. Thank you for watching Encounter. And you're in for a treat tonight. So let me give you just a preview of what's going to happen tonight. Tonight we're going to start right back at anchor number one. So you couldn't, you couldn't have picked a better time if you're here for the first time, because uh, we're going to start right, uh, we're going we're gonna to run through the whole curriculum starting tonight. I want to make sure that every single person, if you don't have an, an encounter Bible study book, if you got one in the house, or if you, if you don't have one, raise your hand. I want to put them in your hands. Okay, I got volunteers that are going to be, they're on, they're on the table when you first walk in. So go get one. Make sure you get one. I want, you're going to need it during the service because I'm going to be talking about it at the end of the talk. I want to make sure everyone has an encounter Bible study book uh, because we're going to work through that book. We're going to do a little work through it tonight. You're going to work through it during the week. Okay, yeah, everyone gets books. Yeah, you get a book, you get a book, you get a book. Everybody gets books, okay? This is awesome. (laughs) Feels like the Oprah Winfield, uh, Winfrey, whatever. Anyway, a couple of other things real quick. Hey, tomorrow morning from 9 to 1 o'clock, there's a prayer conference here at Church of the Savior. I want to encourage you to be a part of it. Uh, Just show up, just be a part of it. Uh, It's from 9 to 1 we're going to learn about the Holy Spirit. We're going to learn about prayer. And it's going to be a great conference from 9 to 1 right here tomorrow. Uh, so listen, you guys ready? Yeah. Let's pray. Our Father, we just invite you into our mess, into our lives. We invite your presence. We invite your power. We invite your love. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to have your way. Flood this place with your power and your love, your truth, your grace, and your peace. Give us listening ears so that your word wouldn't fall to the ground tonight. Transform us, change us so that we walk out of here more like Jesus than we did when we walked in. Give us hope and give us the desire to want to get well and to stop playing God because only you are God, and you are God alone. So with that being said, we worship you. We adore you. We declare our love for you. And we pray that our worship, our actions, our words, our motives would be a sweet aroma to you. And I pray that your presence blows us out the water tonight. And we pray for living water to fill us once again so that we could be changed and transformed and walk out of here just like Jesus. Have your way as we sing to an audience of one. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Come on, get up on your feet. Let's worship. Amen. Amen. All right. How many of you know, and maybe you don't know, let me just tell you, that our God is a God that is not phased by anything that you bring to him. I have a friend who he talks about things in life. And I tell you, I just be honest, I've had a week. So I need this right now just to remember who God is <clears throat> and who I'm not and just letting him do his thing. And um, I have this friend and he says, it's like this. It's like when you have a little child, maybe you have children or kids in your life and something gets messed up and they just come to you and they say, you know, fix it. Like they get the jump rope or something, it's all jumbled up and they don't know what to do and they just say, fix it because they know that you can, in their mind, 100%, you can fix it. And so I just pray that as we worship together, 
we would be those people with childlike faith just say, Daddy, just, just fix it because I don't know what to do. I need you to do it. And so our set tonight is just remembering who he is and how he has all the power to fix it, whatever that is. Amen? So sing with us. I won't forget the wonders of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, set back the waters of my release. Oh, we are
we buried my sister, and it broke our hearts. Um, we'd been praying for her for a very, very long time, and she lived 20 years of addiction, 20 years of, um, of chasing after what she thought would fulfill her. And in the last year, she just ran and began to run after something else that could fill her, and that was God. And it wasn't until the last two months uh, that she was alive that she clinged to God. She held on to the hope that he was a redeemer, that he didn't care about anything she had done, would do, has done. Uh, he, he is a God who redeems us and redeems our lives from the pit. And there's no place we could fall that his hand isn't deeper still to catch us. And, and I praise the Lord. I praise the Lord because she's singing with us now, but she's standing before the throne room of God, and she's whole and she's complete and she's free. And uh, so this next song is talking about how there's no grave that could hold our bodies down, and there's no grave, no grave. So. Oh, shame is a prison. It's cool.
talking to If you walked out of the grave I'm walking to
Hallelujah. I want to make sure everyone, before we get started, does everyone get a book? We have some extra books right here. Does everyone have an encounter Bible study? I want to make sure everyone has it in their hands. I got some up front here. Got more up front. You're going to need it because I'm giving you homework this week. You get homework. Father, we just thank you for compelling us to take off our mask so that we can get honest with you once and for all. We can stop playing God. We can get honest with you. And tonight, I pray that you would give us the desire and the want to to get well and to uh, stop playing games with other people, with ourselves, with you. And I pray that healing, miraculous healings would take place tonight as a result of your word. So move in power. Don't let anyone leave this building without them being changed and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, I gotta move. I got a lot of ground to cover. In early March... The world was turned upside down by a virus that no one was prepared for. Everyone agree with that? Nobody, and I mean nobody, knew anything about this coronavirus. And it's been a learning curve for the United States and practically for the rest of the world. Medical professionals, infectious disease experts, scientists, they all knew nothing about this virus. And while the scientists and researchers and medical professionals were busy learning about the virus, they told us to do three things. Right? They said, wash your hands often and use hand sanitizers. The second, they said, isolate yourself. Lock down for a couple of weeks so we can flatten the curve. Remember that one? And then the third one is wear masks to protect yourself from getting the virus. Now, washing your hands often, using hand sanitizers, always a good habit. Very good habit. If everyone did that, there would be less coronavirus outbreaks, less flu less cold cases, and it's a good practice to do. Bob Newhart said we should do it, so we should do it. And so it's a very good practice, good idea, good habit. But there was a ton of confusion regarding the lockdown, the isolating, uh, and the wearing of masks. First they said to isolate so that we can flatten the curve. So everyone was in lockdown. Everything shut down. The whole country shut down. The economy shut down. We were locked down. And then the curve was flattened. And then they told us to keep isolating. And we'll get back to you for the reasons. They told us to keep isolating, keep everything locked down so that we can get a handle on it. And they've been saying that basically since March. And it's sad to say, but there are some leaders that want to keep us in isolation, keep us locked down for political gain. Because they, ha they have no interest in your personal well-being. And fact is... And for some reason, nobody seems to be talking about this. They're not talking about the consequences of having everything shut down has done more damage than the virus itself. And nobody talks about that. I mean, we're talking about people losing jobs. We're talking about businesses going under. We're talking about suicides are up. Drug use, overdoses are up. Abuse is up. Crime is through the roof. Abortions are up. Because always know that that's an essential service. Spousal and child abuse is up. Sex crimes. Women and children and young men are being sexually assaulted like never before. Do you know that every 73 seconds, someone is getting sexually assaulted in the United States? One out of every six women have been sexually assaulted or have been attacked sexually in their lifetime. One in four girls and one in six boys will be sexually molested by the time they turn 18 years old. Every nine minutes, a child is being sexually assaulted in the United States. You know what that means? By the time this service is done, seven children will be sexually assaulted in the United States by the time we're done here tonight. And get this, five out of every 1,000 perpetrators will end up in prison. Something is wrong there. And many on the left now call it sexual orientation for the child who is being sexually assaulted and... Get this, a sexual preference for the adult pedophile. That's how upside down our world is. The California Attorney General 
at the time, several years ago, stopped enforcing Jessica's law, which prohibits a registered sex offender from residing less than 2,000 feet from places where children hang out like schools and playgrounds. In doing so, that person declared open season on children being sexually assaulted. That same person helped, decided, refused to help actually hundreds of victims, mostly young boys who were sexually molested by priests from the Catholic Church. More than 50 cities sued the Catholic Church, except one city refused to comply, and that was the city of San Francisco. And they didn't support the victims. They sided with the church. And that was the same person. That same person is actually running for vice president of the United States. That's why that side will never get my vote. Because it's not a, it's not a person thing. It's a biblical thing. And a, and a person who follows Jesus always has to vote biblically. You have to look for the persons whose values align mostly with Scripture. And the Christian always starts with the sanctity of life and God's design for the family. And when there's a party that's completely opposed to that, there's no way any person who has Jesus on their heart should ever vote for them. Amen. That's just the way it is. Amen. Now, Amen. those stats were pre-COVID stats. Experts say those numbers are now through the roof. Most of the people sexually assaulted will never tell a single soul. They take that secret to their graves. And by doing so, they have to wear a mask their entire life. The mask covers their pain and presents a false image that they're doing fine when that pain has never been dealt with and healed by the healer, Jesus Christ. You see, being isolated took people's fear to new heights. I mean, we're talking about anxiety, stress, depression, hopelessness. Old patterns resurfacing was another result of the lockdown. During the lockdown, drugs, alcohol, porn, fear, abuse, hate, rage, insecurity. And the list is, and I could go on. Hundreds of things all escalated to new levels never seen in this country. Crime and murder rates are through the roof. Looting out of control. Riots are the norm, and people are calling them peaceful. More people were put in danger by staying home because of abuse than letting them get back into society and back into their schools. Isolations and lockdowns, here's the bottom line, are never, ever a long-term solution to anything. Fact is, but here's the deal. Oh, you're next. Now I'm going to be talking about you. Fact is that people who have been hurt, abused, forgotten, and rejected, well, they've been isolating for years. That's you guys. They run away from the cross instead of running to the cross. We run away from people who can help us, and we run to, to people who, const who constantly hurt us. Isolation, listen to me very carefully, is the enemy of community. And we need community. We need each other. We get well. We get better together. That's just a lockdown. Let's talk about the masks. That's what the, the name of this talk is. You can, you can take your mask off now. First they said to wear them. Then they said not to wear them. And then they said only healthcare workers should wear them. Then they said to wear them again. Then they said it would prevent you from getting the disease. Then they said it would not prevent you from getting the disease. Then they said it would prevent others from getting the disease from you. Who knows what to believe? Here's what I believe about the mask. It's, it's hard to believe what anybody's saying because everything is so politicized these days. But I do know this. People have been wearing masks long before COVID hit us this past spring. It's not uncommon for the majority of us to find a church, even a Bible study, even to find a place to serve and still cover up and mask the pain and the problems in your life. We shake our heads at people who have gone insane with the mask debate. Fights are breaking out on airplanes. It's crazy. People are driving with masks on and gloves like this. They're not even looking at traffic. You want to smack them through the window. The masks are driving everybody crazy. Right? But I want to say this. 
but all you have to do is show up at any church on any Sunday morning, and what you'll find is one masquerade party of people hiding behind their masks. Every single Sunday. The majority of Christ followers go to church, and they'll go to church an entire lifetime hiding and never healing. See, people come to church to hide. People come to encounter to heal. See, most will come with a mask on instead of feeling safe to take the mask off and share the good, the bad, the ugly, and get vulnerable with honest and trusted people. But let me say this. But what if, dream with me for a second here, friends. What if there was a community of people got together and embraced the fact that it's okay not to be okay? It's just not okay to stay there. It's never okay to stay there. What if there was a community of imperfect people from church that would do the complete opposite of what your fears and insecurities are telling you what to believe? And they would love you more. They would respect and accept you for who you really are when you get brutally honest and transparent with them. Because I know what the fear is. The fear is if I tell you who I really am, if I tell you about my dark secret, if I tell you about my dark past, and you reject me or judge me, then I'm all I've got. And I can't handle another rejection in my life. But the opposite happens at Encounter. We actually love you more. We respect you more. The complete opposite happens. As a pastor who's been walking alongside people for more than two decades now, I've seen this scenario being played out every day in the lives of people. At some point, somewhere in a person's life, a terrible event occurred that caused relational, spiritual, in many cases, physical pain, maybe emotional pain. And you walk around with the scars to prove it, don't you? Maybe it was the death of a loved one. Maybe it was the passing of a parent. Maybe it was a bad parent. Maybe you didn't grieve properly. Maybe it's an absent father wound. Maybe you abused by your father or grandfather. Maybe it was a divorce, a breakup. Maybe it was being rejected, abused, molested, abandoned. Or something as simple as never being told that you were loved. Maybe it was an unreconciled relationship with someone important in your life. Maybe you can't even think of something terrible that happened in your life, but you inherited a generational curse that was handed down to you, compliments of your family. Maybe even family members you don't even know about. Maybe it was a bad church hurt. And nothing hurts worse than a church hurt. Trust me, I know. And most people don't know how to fix or get rid of these hurts. And guess what? You're not supposed to. We don't know what to do with them. We try and manage the pain, deny the pain, suppress the pain, medicate the pain, transfer the pain to another person, make believe the pain is gone, even believe the lie that time will make the pain go away. And time only makes it worse. Because unresolved issues and pain in our lives always come out in some form of compulsion, fear, worry, or insecurity. It gives us a distorted view of who God is. It gives us a distorted view who God calls us, what our identity is. It distorts everything. It causes relational issues, causes problems in some or all of your relationships. I can't tell you how many people I meet with that they have a boatload of guilt, regret, and shame, and they can't shake it. They walk around with that guilt. They walk around with that shame. See, when you swallow your guilt, your stomach keeps score because our bodies were not designed by God to carry guilt and shame. And I'm here to tell you this, just in case you're wondering, nobody has it all together. Nobody has it all together. We're all broken people, trusting in the grace and power of God to keep us, heal us, sustain us, and bless us. And I want to tell you today that pastors and leaders, oh, we got issues. I got big issues. Ex Carolyn. People think we got it all together. Oh, they got it all together. Oh, trust me, we ain't all that. We got problems. But here's what I do know. We know that one encounter with God can change you for a lifetime. One encounter with God can change you for a It did for us. I had one encounter with Jesus. It changed me for a lifetime. One encounter. Many of you have never had an encounter with the living God. Well, guess what? Tonight, you're going to have an encounter with God. He's here, by the way. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God. This is the reason why we named the ministry of encounter. 
That's why we called it Encounter. We didn't call it the best Bible study, you know, east of California. We called it Encounter. You know why? So you can have an encounter with God. So you can hear the voice of God. So you can be led by the Spirit of God, get in the presence of God, and be healed by the power of God. If you're not experiencing that, you're missing the boat. That's where the action is. God challenged me when I accepted the call to go into full-time ministry. The Holy Spirit said, Bill, are you going to bring my people to where the action is? I said, yes, sir. And that's where the action is, to hear the voice of God, be blessed by the, be led by the Spirit of God, get in the presence of God, and be healed by the power of God. Listen, Jesus didn't come to the world to accomplish everything so we can be entertained in church, but to have an encounter with him in church. The sole purpose of encounter is to put people in a position where they can have miraculous encounters with the Holy Spirit, where the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, reveals and rips out the root issues of our lives that keep us stuck. Anybody need to get unstuck tonight? Come on. You're going to get unstuck. You're going to be so free, the world won't know what to do with you. Let me say this as clear as I can. Encounter is not a recovery ministry for people who struggle with drugs and alcohol. It's a great place if you struggle with drugs and alcohol to come. Encounter is a discipleship ministry that helps broken and hurting people overcome life's adversities so they can discover the free, devoted life to Jesus Christ. We are a ministry for imperfect people like you and me. Encounter exists to humble us and remind us that no one can get it together until the Holy Spirit puts you back together. Some people come to grow. Some people come to encounter to heal. Some come to grow and heal. You see, if I don't live out what I'm teaching at Encounter, I'll sink fast. I teach these things not to say, hey, this is something great. I need this stuff. If I'm not living out these anchors of hope each and every day, goodbye, Bill Reeser. You'll never see me again because I'll sink fast. This is how I keep from getting complacent. This is how I stay in the game. See, we all have issues. There are no perfect people. There's no perfect church. And if you find a perfect church, don't go to it. You'll ruin it. (laughs) See, when you reach a point when you think you got it all figured out and there is no desperation for the presence and power of God, that's a dangerous place for you to be in. It's one of the most dangerous places people get themselves into, this complacency mode. If you don't have a hunger for the presence of God, the power of God, Okay, you're in a dangerous spot. There's a term for it. You know what we call? Plain God. Plain God. People do it all the time. Listen to me very carefully. Plain God is the ultimate symptom of codependency. Because if you're not dependent on God, which is a healthy dependency, then you become codependent by letting other people steal your attention and devotion. So, I want to speak to the codependents in the room. Fasten your seatbelts. Here's a short list, not the total list. I don't have time to go to the total list because there's about a thousand characteristics of codependence. Here's just a short list which you may find yourself in. There are fixing codependence. You try and fix other people because they can't fix themselves. There's a lot of fixing codependence. There are savior codependence. Okay, you try and save other people because they can't save themselves. You have a Jesus complex. Maybe you couldn't save a parent, so you're going to save everyone that was as dysfunctional as your dysfunctional dad, and that's the only person you'll ever date. Because you have to save that person. And then there are, and this, there's a lot of people in this one, there's Holy Spirit codependence. Oh yeah, I know who you are. You try and reach others by convicting them and telling them what they're doing is wrong. You try and guide them into truth because they have no convictions and no desire to submit to truth. Are you feeling good now? And then there's the most common one, enabling codependence. Enabling codependence. Here's some characteristics of an an enabling codependent. You may be one if this characterizes you. You take responsibility for helping others at the expense of your own needs. You seek love and worth through helping, but live in fear of abandonment. You endure mistreatment and live in survival mode. You excuse and enable others' ongoing dysfunctional behaviors. You fail or 
You fail to set or keep personal boundaries, and you fail to follow through with consequences when boundaries are broken. Friends, let me tell you this. Listen to me very carefully. Someone's about to get set free right now. There is only one person who can fix. There is only one person who can save. There is only one person who can convict and guide someone into truth. At some point, codependence, you've got to take your Jesus mask off and say to the people you love, I am not your savior. I am not your Holy Spirit. You will no longer be an idol to me, and you will no longer be a God to me. Jesus is more important to me than you are. So many of you need to get well from codependency. This is why the first question we ask around here is, do you want to get well? Do you? You know, I, I was telling this to a person. I have helped people. I have taken people through these anchors for years, and I have witnessed so many people never get through anchor one because they don't want to get well. What do you need to get well of tonight? Fear, worry, anxiety, uncontrolled thoughts, hopelessness, compulsions, bitterness, insecurities, unforgiveness, unbelief, the spiraling, the spiraling thought of your life being out of control, depression, unresolved to past hurts, wounds, got a few bad habits, got some strongholds in your life, got a few problems, got some shame, got some guilt, got some regrets, got loneliness in your life, got some marital problems, got conflict issues, got some EGR people in your life, extra grace required people, Got some HM people in your life, high maintenance people. Got some CTP people, CTP. I almost messed that up. You know what that is? Crazy train people. You got some crazy train people in your life. Got a case of the if onlys and only if, where you live with these, oh, if only I had done that, if only I did that. Listen, if you answered yes to any of those, welcome to the human race. We all struggle with something. Encounter is for everyone, unless you've lived a flawless life. We all need a ministry like Encounter, where hope can be found. Let me ask you a personal question. Is there something you've done, or maybe something that was done to you, and you've never told a single person? God knows. And the Bible says, you know, in James 5, 16, confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Some of you never find healing because you've never confessed that to another person. I know what some of you are thinking. You have no idea what I've done. You have no idea. Let me tell you something. Your sin isn't that special. It's just not. And God's not shocked. Or you have no idea what was done to me. Let me tell you something. I may not know what was done to you, but Jesus does. And he's wanting you to get it out so that he can finally heal you once and for all. Whatever that hurt is. Whatever it is. You see... It doesn't matter how bad you are. It doesn't matter how good you are. The most important thing is how forgiven you are and how free you are. And I want to say to you, how bad does it have to get before you admit that you need some help? How bad does that relationship have to get, that problem, that memory? You know what I'm talking about. When you lay your head on the pillow at night, that your mind starts racing because you don't have peace in your life. How bad does that have to get before you say, I need to get well? See, people always wear masks or in denial, and denial will make you compare yourself to others. So you don't have to work on you. That's, what, that's how that works. It's called the cop-out of comparing. Here's what that looks like. You convince yourself. In other words, you rationalize. You tell yourself rational lies because the biggest liar to you is you, to yourself. You convince yourself that by comparing your problems to other people's problems that you don't have a serious problem. Well, I'm not like that guy. Well, I'm not like those people that encounter and you focus on other people all the time. Sometimes you even hear the word recovery. And your denial kicks in. You overlook who recovery is really for. And you convince yourself, oh, encounters for those people. I get that all the time. People come up to me on the weekends. Oh, Bill, I love what you do for those people. I say, well, you're those people. <laughs> what do you mean those people? I said, you need to get well. You should come. Listen, the only difference between those people and us is the grace of God. The blood of Jesus levels the playing ground. The foot of the cross levels the playing ground for all of us. The one thing that we all have in common, we've all been hurt in life. If you haven't been hurt in life, I'd like to talk to you. What we do different is how we manage that pain. And again, let me say this as clearly as I can. It's not a recovery program for those people. 
You know, here's what I think, and, 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 and guys, listen to me very carefully from Revive. It is so degrading to label people by their sins, and I will never label you by your sins. See, we struggle. We may struggle with drugs and alcohol, okay, but that's not who we are, okay? That's not who we are. It's what we struggle with. You're a child of the king. See, the devil knows your name but calls you by your sin. God knows your sin, but he calls you by your name. And so you have to understand that. And speaking of sins, it's amazing how ugly your sins look when other people commit them. <laughs> Let me ask you. Listen, you've got, you got, you got a couple options here. You can go through life with one of two choices, pretending like you've got it all together or getting it all together. But you'll never get it all together as long as you pretend you've got it all together. Because we never get it all together until the Holy Spirit puts us back together. This is what makes Encounter the ministry that it is. Listen, there's no pain God can't heal. There's no shame God's grace can't cover. There's no guilt God's blood can't forgive. And there's no sin beyond the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Amen. There just isn't. And the starting point is come to the realization of really applying Anchor One to your life. What is Anchor One? Here it is. Read it out loud. Do it for me out loud with conviction. You read it. Okay, that was the lesson. Now's the Bible study. Open your books to lesson one. Okay, go to lesson one. Just keep it there. Fast forward to lesson one. Introductory, lesson one, lesson one. Just keep it on lesson one. Okay, here's the scene. Here's what's called the fall of man. It's Genesis chapter three. I'm going to read it to you from scripture, and then we're going to break it down. Okay, but look up here for now. Go to, go to lesson one, but look up here for now, okay? And I'm going to break this down for you. You ready? It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. So in this scene, here we have Father God. We have our Father in heaven. We have, the, we have Father God walking around. We have the devil been invited to the party, and we have Adam and Eve. So these are four players here. So the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? It's a lie. Did God really say? It's a lie. Lie number one. Did God really say? You know what the inference there is? God is a liar, therefore he can't be trusted. That's the inference. That's what the devil was trying to produce in Eve. And, and, and the other inference there is who would believe and trust a liar? So the first thing he says is, did God really say? That's amazing that he starts out with that. Line number two, watch this. Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, she engages in dialogue, which is a mistake. You don't engage in dialogue with the devil. You don't engage in dialogue with the enemy that's putting voices and thoughts in your head that are not coming from scripture. You don't dialogue with the enemy of your soul. You resist him. You reject him. You rebuke him. You take authority over him, and you cancel him out of any part of your life in Jesus' name part of your heritage. But she engages. That's her first mistake. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Here's the second lie the devil presents before her. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. Oh man, did you catch? here's the inference there. God is not faithful to his promises or his threats. They're just words. God is lying because he doesn't want you to see like him. That's what he's saying. That's the inference of the second lie. I, it won't kill you. How many times have you heard that lie? Well, I can keep drinking. It won't kill me. I can keep eating these donuts. It won't kill me. I could be doing these drugs. It won't kill me. I could be, you know, I could just watch porn just one time. It won't kill me. It won't destroy my marriage. And it does every single time. Line number three. For God knows 
that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. And here it is, line number three. You will be like God. You will be just like God. Here's the inference there. There's no need for a God who is your equal. Why would you trust a God who is your equal? If you can be just like God, why would you trust God? You can be your own God. You can play God without anyone telling you what to do because you are the boss and king of your life. And that lie is ingrained into all of us. That's a, general cur that's a generational curse that we got, that Adam and Eve got duped into. How many people, including me, because this is how I lived my life, I thought I was God. I, I, listen, I didn't want anybody telling me what to do. I hated to be told what to do. Is anybody else here? Want to be honest with me? That hates to be told what to do? No. Come on now. We've all been duped. This is all of us. This is the fall of man. This is called playing God. Line number four, watch this. For God knows that when you eat, it, uh, eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, watch this, knowing good and evil. You know what the inference there is? In other words, you can have your own moral code. You don't need God to tell you what's right and what's wrong. You decide what's right and what's wrong. You hear this all the time. You hear this all the time. People who now support the murdering of babies all the way up to the ninth trimester, all the way up to the last stage of pregnancy, and even murdering them once they're born, boast that they're people of faith. You see that? It comes right from here. You don't need another person to tell you what to do. You can have your own moral code when you're playing God. You see, the consequences of the fall of man and playing God. Let's finish the scripture. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband. Whoa, the husband was there the whole time. What was he doing? What was he doing? What are you doing, Adam? He's supposed to be leading. That was his job. He was, he was watching the whole thing take place. And she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. Shame, first result. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man. He didn't call for Eve. He called for the man because he was in charge. He was her protector. He was supposed to lead her spiritually. He's the priest of his home. And he let this happen on his watch. Right. He called for Adam. Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid. Don't miss that. I was afraid because I was naked. Shame. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded? Of course he knows this. Commanded you not to eat from? The man said, watch this. The man said, well, the girl you hooked me up with. It's her fault. Then he asked Eve, he said, who made you do this? The devil made me do it. God calls out Adam. Adam blames his wife. Eve blames the devil, and God tells him they're all cursed. That's how that story ends. Listen, these are the consequences of the fall of man and playing God. I don't have time to go through the whole scripture, but here, read it for yourself. Read the whole chapter of Genesis 3. It's in your lesson. Here's, here's the result. Shame gets introduced into their lives. And they ran and hid from God instead of running to God. Fear and being afraid consumed them. So shame, fear, being afraid. Number four, passivity and the choice not to lead but be a follower from Adam becomes the curse of choice for most men. It is sickening that men in the church are followers and not leaders, not the priests of their homes. Our job is to take our family, our kids, our wife, wherever they are spiritually, our job is to take them to the next level and protect them 
and be the priest of our home and a priest unto our God. We are not to be passive. We are not to be complacent because complacency is a dangerous place to get to because complacency will always lead to confusion, then compromise, and then catastrophe. But the catastrophe is never the catastrophe. It's just the destination that complacency and passivity will always get you to. It's a bad disease for men. Reject passivity. Step up. Be a man. Be God's man. Be a priest unto your God and be the priest of your home. You can do that. Listen, God curses the devil, Adam and Eve, their offspring, the land, and everything in it as a result of sin entering into the world. That's why everything is broken in this world. We are born into a cursed, broken, and sinful world. Listen to me very carefully as I break this down. We're born into sin, we're born with sin, and we're born with a sin nature. I don't care how good you are. You have those three things that you're born into the world with, and you need God's grace to get rid of it and to heal it and fix it in your life. We're also born separated from our Father in heaven because of that sin. We're born in need of a savior. These are all problems that can't be solved or fixed. People have tried, but it's called playing God. Enter Jesus Christ, who came to take care of our sin problem, to, to restore our relationship with our Father, to make sure that there's nothing blocking our relationship with our Father by taking our sin, becoming our sin, forgiving our sin, defeating our sin, defeating the grave, defeating death, being resurrected, and being made new as the victor over all sin of every single person has ever committed sin, and whoever put their trust in Jesus Christ can be forgiven and have eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus did for us. Have you accepted what he's done for you on the cross? Because that's what he came to do. He came to fix what was broken in the garden. Last scene, okay, last scene, go to your Bibles, the book of John chapter 5, and this is the other part of anchor one. We have to make the decision to get well and stop playing God. What does it mean to get well? Well, I say that a lot. You hear it a lot. I say it all the time, but not everybody wants to get well. So here we have a scene where we have an invalid who was sick for 38 years. We have Jesus. We have an angel who pops out of heaven, touches the water where people would hang out every day, and the first one in the water, after the angel touches the water, gets healed. So that's the scenario. So let's pick it up. I'm going to be reading out of the King James. I don't know if it's up on the screen, but it's the King James Version says it this way. The New King James Version says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, in, now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of water. You ready? Here it is. I love this passage. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain, watch this now, I love this. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to get well? Don't, don't miss that. Jesus saw him and he knew of his condition. You know, Jesus sees you and he knows of your condition. He sees you where you are. How did Jesus know of his condition? That's what makes him Jesus. That's what makes him Jesus. He breaks all the rules. He knows everything. Everything. Listen, your future is a memory to God. And Jesus sees you. So here's the deal. We have a person, an invalid for 30 years who didn't want to get well. A cure was made available, but he wasn't interested. But the healer shows up. Friends, the healer has shown up tonight. Jesus saw him, and he asked him, do you want to get well? You know what the guy does? You know what the guy does when, when he says, do you want to get well? He gives him an excuse. 
He gives him an ex- This is crazy. Watch this. Watch what the man says. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me in the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone goes ahead of me. Sir, I tried to get to encounter, but I didn't have dinner. I was hungry. He has an excuse. But what I love about Jesus, he doesn't even respond to the guy's excuse. He just tells them, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. The man walks. The man gets up. He walks. He doesn't even know it's Jesus who heals him. Jesus approaches him again and says this to him. See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Here's the deal of the story. Jesus speaks a total of 28 words to the man. 28 words to the man in two separate conversations. And I think it's the best 28-word sermon that you'll ever hear. And it's a sermon for you tonight. I'm going to wrap this whole thing up by preaching the 28-word sermon that Jesus preached to that guy. And he said, do you want to get well? Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. It's a great sermon. It's a great sermon. Listen, this whole thing about, you know, getting well and then falling back and then getting well and then falling back, okay, it's not supposed to be part of recovery. When Jesus tells you to get up, pick up your mat, and walk, you if you walk with Jesus every day of your life, you'll never have another relapse or setback in your life ever, ever again. You can be free. So I want to tell you tonight, worship team, come on up. That's all I got. But I want to tell you this. You can take your mask off now. You can take your mask off now. But that means you have to get honest with God. That means you got to stop playing God. That means you have to make the decision to say, I want to get well. What do you need to get well of tonight? What area of your life are you still playing God? What secret sin do you need forgiveness and healing for? And maybe it's not about what you've done for many of you. Maybe it's about what's been done to you. And you've never been able to let that go. And tonight, Jesus is speaking to you. And he's saying, when are you going to give that to me and let it go? When are you going to leave that at the foot of the cross so that you can live, so that you can be healed, so that you can be free? How long are you going to hold on to that bitterness? How long are you going to hold on to that unforgiveness? How long are you going to hold on to that habit? How long, codependence, are you going to hold on to that control? You can't be anybody's Holy Spirit. You can't be anybody's Savior. You can't be anybody's fixer. There's only one fixer, Savior, and Holy Spirit, and it's God himself. So whatever you need to get well of tonight, I want everyone to stand. I think I scared the worship team off. (laughs) They're repenting in the back of stuff they need to get well from. I don't know. (laughs) No, they're not. I'm just kidding. Um, You know where it starts? You know the guy that was able to get up at the pool and walk, I don't know what was going on in his head, but he had to be thinking, if this guy tells me to get up and walk, it must mean he can do something about it. Because he made me do something I couldn't do for the past 38 years. And if Jesus is telling you, get up, pick up your mat and walk, you know what that means? That means Jesus intends to do something about it. And that means Jesus has the power to get you up out of your mess, to get you up out of your whatever it is. But it starts with Jesus. It starts with a relationship with Jesus. Jesus came to fix our sin problem and our brokenness, our playing God problem, and our separation from our Father. If you want that relationship, 
and you've never, ever really asked Jesus to be your Lord, and you want to get well, is there anyone in the house that wants Jesus that way? That's right. Come on. Pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, I need you. I need you now more than ever. I don't need you just tonight. I need you every day, every moment of my life. So tonight, I open up my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are the Christ. You are my Lord and my Savior, the healer of my soul, the forgiver of my sins, and the redeemer of my life. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, fill me, fill me. With, your love with your love and your gifts and your, gifts. And your, power, and your power and your healing, and your healing. To, set to set me free and give me the power, me the power to get up, get up, pick up my mat, up my mat and, walk, and walk and never return to that place, never to that place. Ever, again. ever again. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations. Whatever your need is, Whatever you need, and whatever you need God to do for you, we're going to worship. Come to the altar. Jesus is here. He sees you, and he knows of your condition. Come meet him. Amen. Jesus. Whatever you got, he can take it. Whatever it is, he can redeem it.
by your power, the oceans open wide, your fire fall down, heaven and earth collide, King Jesus, forever by my side, shake the mountains, shake the mountains. you love him tonight? Can we show God some appreciation? You're not off the hook yet. Before, you dis before I dismiss you, on that lesson one, there's a little box that says pray. So here's the deal. There's three prayers that I want you to pray over all the scriptures and the lessons. And the prayers are, Lord, what are you saying to me in your word? And you wait. And you wait as long as you have to. And whatever you hear from God or whatever you think you hear from God, I want you to write it down in a journal. Second prayer is, Lord, what are you saying to me? It's a different prayer. The third prayer is, how do you want me to live this out in my life? And I want you to write it down. This is for you. It's not for me. Okay, I will quiz you next week. But then there are questions. There are nine questions. Write out your answers. Do the lesson. Okay, I just gave you a head start on the lesson. Okay? Tonight was anchor lesson number one. Next week we'll do anchor number two. Okay? Okay? We're going to do anchor lesson number two. We're going to do some work here. Okay? Don't come back without your work because let me tell you something. You be like that person in the car with the mask on and gloves. Don't let me come at you. <laughs> All right. All right, Lord, we pray for your favor over everyone. I pray that you dispatch the army of angels. I heard Jensen Franklin say this weekend, the problem is, is that there are too many angels that are unemployed. So, Lord, we put them to work. And we pray that you dispatch all the best warring angels for every single person and every single family to do battle, to watch over us. And I pray for a spirit of humility to finally say, you are God and I am not. And today I made the decision to get well. And today I got up, I picked up my mat, and I started walking with you, Jesus. Thank you for being my healer. Thank you for being my deliverer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Everyone be seated. Revive, guys. You are dismissed. Everyone wait a few minutes. Whatever you need. Love you, guys. Love you, man. Love you. Love you. Love you. Love you. Love you.